Hello, everybody, and welcome to 2023's first podcast with the one and only Paul Belgrove. Paul, I'm really excited to have you on the show. Happy New Year. Thank you, Elena, and Happy New Year to you and everybody else. <laughs> so let's get into it, Paul, because today's theme is one that I'm really passionate about. It's all around the language of quality. So um, before we get started talking about the language of quality, maybe you could give us a brief intro as to who you are and your years of experience in quality. Very good, thank you. So yes, I've been working in uh, quality and regulatory and indeed a number of other functions in the pharmaceutical and medtech space for, for more than 30 years now. And I've been working for small companies, less than 20 people, up to larger companies that everybody's heard of. Uh, for instance, uh, GE Healthcare, Cardinal Health, Beckton Dickinson. And probably one of the things that's a bit different in my career is I've not only worked in quality and regulatory, particularly in some of the smaller companies. I've also worked in manufacturing, operations, supply chain, even IT. And I think that'll maybe one of the things that's helped me in my career in quality. So, so some really interesting companies and some very well-known names that you've mentioned there, BD, GE Healthcare. These are companies that are actually really known for having a strong culture of quality as well. Um, you mentioned actually that you haven't always been in quality your whole career, but obviously that's what I've known you for. Yes. <laughs> um, but so, so my, my first question is, tell us the story of how you actually got into quality. So, yes, probably similar to many people in the career now in quality, I got into quality by accident. Uh, and I think that's a story that I hear from many people. Uh, I'm actually a, a chemist by training and qualification. So my first role was in labs in a small pharma company. I was actually testing things, measuring chemicals, etc. Uh, and that was a role in quality. So I apl applied for a job that used my, my chemistry qualifications, but that then brought me into the quality function. And it's, uh, it, it, it's interesting. It's not necessarily a thing that everyone says, I, I want to work in quality. You want to do, use your skills, but you can end up in quality. And I think that's, uh, that's a benefit. There's not so many pure quality qualifications. There's more these days, but there's not many that lead people to target a career in quality. But you leverage lots of other skills that you've picked up uh, professionally when you move into a role like that. It's really funny because actually uh, they, they, they say the same thing about recruitment, Paul. I don't know if you know that, but uh, <laughs> if you if you ever have, have asked, uh, have heard my story of how did I ever get into recruitment, recruiting and regulatory and quality, it was also completely by accident. <laughs> um, and uh, some sometimes that's that's how the best stories end up, isn't it? Um, Indeed. <laughs> so you mentioned about qualifications and actually this is a question people tend to ask me quite a lot. Um, as somebody who has recruited many, many people over the years, what are your thoughts on uh, qualifications versus experience? So I think for, for everybody in a role in quality, one of the things you have to have is some credibility with the organization that you, that you work within. So to achieve that, uh, it's maybe lazy on the recruiter benefit uh, perspective to actually say, if this person's got a degree in chemistry, a degree in engineering, a degree in whatever, that shows a certain degree of competence. But I think that's probably the entry, uh, entry requirement that you say, yes, I can have a dialogue with the professionals in the other functions. I can understand what they're saying. I, I think that's important. But then when you start talking about how to be effective in quality, you can learn, you should learn the, the basic skills of a quality role, but then you need to go beyond that. You need to understand what is the what are the expectations of the of the regulatory bodies, what are the expectations of the industry in general, and then you can actually think about how to solve problems based on experience as well as a technical knowledge. And I think that blend is very important. So, so for for our listeners who are earlier on in their career. Mm -hmm. And or maybe that are currently in a slightly different discipline, but thinking about making that transition, because that's mm -hmm. something we're going to speak about later as well. Right. Transitioning into quality from different areas. What advice would you give them uh, in terms of the first steps? So the question I'm frequently asked is, should I do a certification in 
or a mini course in quality or should I try to uh, find a job in quality? So it's often sort of like, what is gonna get me the foot in the door first, the certification or a bit of experience? What would you say? I would say to actually get that foot in the door, definitely get that certification in quality. But I think when you're going through that uh, certification, some of the things you can do online and it's purely one-to-one, -one, but there are other courses that have you know, formal lessons and group meetings and so on. Mm. What I found very beneficial in my earlier career whilst I was taking qualifications in quality, as well as uh, uh, working at the same time, which I think is important, is to actually go along to those courses with your, your mind and your ears open and listen to what the other people in the, in the, in the groups are saying. Because often in those early stage courses, you won't be there just with pharmaceutical people or just with medical device people there'll be people there out of manufacturing industry automotive industry food industry there's things that you can learn from just understanding having talking with those people those peers that you're working with about how people do things in other industries and I think that's what's going to be useful to you later in later career because you get to leverage oh I've heard they do that differently in food you know, I've heard they do that in uh, in automotive, and that can be really helpful when you're thinking about how can I solve a particular problem in a particular job in a particular industry that I'm working in at a specific moment. And as we as we look at the industry of particularly medical devices, you can be going from a single big device that is takes months to make and you install one. That's one set of skills. Maybe it's a bit like an aircraft. You can also look at something where you're making millions of units. That could be more like automotive. It could be more like food. Think about those knowledges that you've learned how other people solve problems and use that to solve your own problem. It's difficult to be trying to reinvent the wheel yourself all the time. It's, really, it's a really interesting point you make because often I anecdotally speaking to people as well, what I've what I've discovered is that sometimes the best ideas come at the cross section of two different industries or two different disciplines or two different uh, ways of doing things. And then you get this new idea born out of it. And that's usually where you see like real innovation uh, rather than, you know, that's where you see something that's like a transformation in a process as opposed to just a small, a small improvement um so so it's it's such a good good advice that you're giving Absolutely. um one thing you mentioned briefly in your introduction that I want to circle back to uh, aside from the fact that you've not always always been in quality is that I think you said you worked in IT is that right yes yes I spent time working in IT as well <laughs> so so talk to me about how um working in these other these other areas has mm. sort of helped you in your in your journey um in quality so, so I think if we sit in quality, we're often looking at what the regulations are saying, what the outside world is saying, what the last uh, BSI auditor said, what the last FDA investigator said. And that is one single lens on a problem. If you're working in manufacturing, for example, you're not thinking at all about what the FDA is saying. You're thinking about problems getting plastic granules out of uh, your supplier you're thinking about issues with cost of goods you're thinking about deliveries you're, you're thinking about those practical elements if you spent some time working in that area then you can think about that if I'm as a quality person want to drive this certain change I need to try and explain that in terms that catch the attention of a manufacturing leader Similarly, with the world being much, much more digital these days, I found it very valuable the time that I spent working in the IT organization so that you understand the constraints of networks, you understand the challenges of implementing a new system and you know, cross-fertilizing the other way. When I was actually working in IT, there wasn't necessarily that structure of uh, how do you build and test reliable IT systems. You know, the, the V model that we're used to from uh, from development in devices, uh, that sort of thing was not necessarily thought about in the IT world. So working in IT, you've got that cross fertilization that way of how to test, 
how to design and test in an efficient manner so things actually worked when you switched them on. So that cross fertilization was again very valuable. But there it was always, you know, everyone complains about uh, IT projects are always late, IT projects always go over budget. So a little bit of learning about project management and about that focus on, on costs and that focus, focus on return on investment. That again is a useful thing to think about in quality because we always uh, in quality think about, okay, the company is going from, from here to destination B. And you say, okay, how am I gonna do that? And then you suddenly realize there's a whole load of criteria that you need to meet. And so we just say, okay, it's gonna cost you this much money to get where you want to go. Be able to go that dialogue and say, well, actually, if you went to C instead, you could get 80% of the benefits for 50% of the cost, still 100% compliant, but you were able to have that dialogue. And I think that's the, the benefit from having worked in other functions. So I'm, I'm a linguist, so I'm fascinated about language actually. And um, that's why I'm super excited about this topic. And, and you've already sort of started to broach that, that, that subject now. Mm. So you spoke about return on investment. So, so can you actually break it down for us as to when you're in a quality role and we're talking about return on investment, what does that actually mean? And how can people be talking about return on investment um, with some of their stakeholders? What should they be looking at? So, so I think the first and most important thing, if you imagine you're in a small to medium sized company to begin with, uh, if, if, if you're always quality or even regulatory at the end of the process, they only come to you when, OK, we've designed it, we've decided how we're going to sell it, we're ready to launch it, here's some information, go and get a license, go and get a certificate, go and uh, get the factory ready that's already too late. You, you've already blown it in quality terms because you're then going to be the bad news guy. You're going to say, okay, you didn't think about this. There's this cost. You planned it to be six weeks and you'd be launched. Well, actually it's six months. It's too late. So the important piece is actually further upstream from that, trying to get quality to be part of the team that's involved in planning the whole process end to end. And to do that, you can then make sure that decisions are made and adjusted that actually gives you that end-to-end -end solution all the way to launch and sales. But to actually be able to get into that position, you've got to somehow under be understood as someone who's not just a checkbox guy at the end, but someone who can add value all the way through that process, which means you need to build that relationship with the other members of the leadership team in the organization. You need to then be able to talk about things other than quality. Because if you imagine yourself in a leadership team meeting and you're just sitting there and you just answer the questions on quality and then go back to drinking your coffee and eating your biscuits, that doesn't actually build any, any particular value add for you there. You need to be able to talk to the other members, each other member of the leadership team in the language that they speak which is really coming back to that language of quality piece. Now, it's, it's maybe a bit of a trope, but uh, I, I'm an Englishman who's sitting here in Switzerland and working in Europe. Now, the trope is, of course, when you're in a foreign country, the, the English just speak loudly, clearly <laughs> and slowly in the hope that the rest of the old world will understand. Now, if you think about that in quality terms, if you're sitting in that leadership team, and all you say is, well, it's very clear in 21 CFR 820 para blah, blah, blah. They're not going to really take any interest. In the real world, to be able to be successful in a different country, you have to pick up some language and you interact with people. They know you're a foreigner, but they're much more happy to interact and include you in things. I see it as the same thing for quality professionals in a leadership team you're still going to be talking about quality topics. You're still going to be seen as a way, as a bit of a foreigner in that leadership team, but you actually have to translate what you're saying into things that make sense for that leadership team. So you're talking about speed to access to market. You're not talking about the height of the barrier. You're talking about specific things rather than quoting a paragraph. You're saying, well, we have to do this, this, and this. We have to, simple things. We have to 
put these words on our labels. They don't need to know why it needs to be there. Just need to say, okay, we can do this. This is the minimum we need to do. This is the appropriate thing we need to do. This is how we can lift those barriers so that the, the end goal for me always is for the quality and indeed regulatory teams not to be seen as the business prevention department, which is a quote that's been played back to me more than once. You're actually seen as the, 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 the market access department. You can answer the questions of how do I get there? What do I need to do if I want to sell this product in Chile? What's changing in China? But making sure that you know what's changing in a year or two years, not it comes in next week, so we'd better just stop doing everything and do a crash program. That blows your credibility immediately. So knowing that the organization is going to want to have a lead time, have uh, the ability to build change into a budgeting cycle, to be able to make decisions, as we said, on return on investment. If you can clearly articulate what it's going to take to get into a certain country, you can then actually say, as a business team, you know, that doesn't really work. That's not going to pay back. We thought it was a good idea to go and get into that country. Doesn't look as if the numbers stack up. But if you're at the end of the line and the leadership team has already promised to the board, to the market, yeah, we're going to go into this country. They can't then say not. And you're the bad guy for suddenly saying, well, there's a huge barrier to that specific country. So being part of that dialogue speaking in business terms and doing it enough years ahead or enough months ahead that quality becomes part of the standard planning cycle. That's how you end up building that quality, uh, culture of quality in an organization because you start speaking the same language. You're having that push and pull dialogue and you're part of a broader leadership rather than just being a, a checkbox police role at the end. <laughs> So much to unpack there, Paul. That was really, yeah. really interesting. Um, so, okay. So first question that I have for you, mm. to all the people, you spoke a lot about sitting on a leadership team and being part of a leadership team, but I can tell you in some companies, um, I know for a fact that quality might report to like an operations director and the mm -hmm. operations director is on the leadership team, but actually quality isn't. Uh, they actually don't, they're actually not in those conversations. Um, so how can this person if they're currently not in the room how can they get into the room what do they need to say uh, to be able to be part of those conversations yeah so I think you, again you raised two good points there and I think uh, quality should definitely be be part of the leadership team quality should be on leadership teams but you have to have credibility when you're in there you can't say I must be on the leadership team because I'm quality uh, if when you go in there you put it bluntly embarrass yourself you mm. just sit there quietly and just say no when they <laughs> you're never part of a, a building the organization you're not part of problem solving that's important but i think if you're working with the, the let's say the quality lead reports to the plant manufacturing director and so on which is quite common that plant leader also does not want to surprise leadership up the line so making sure that you give them the cards to play, make them look good, basically, yeah. so that they don't get quality surprises. That helps them build their credibility. And if that leader is, particular, is, a, is a good leader, they will then look for opportunities to give that quality person exposure, to grow that quality person and so on. You can't expect to jump there just because it's a rule. Uh, because that's that bad behavior that uh, that we hurt ourselves with. <laughs> We've got to think about how we can present value to that uh, plant director who then says, you know, let me bring my quality guy in. He'll explain it in detail. Let me share this information with the leadership team. And it makes their life easier. They start to value quality. So it's about getting that person on side and being taking that proactive approach. So it's not it, it's not a thing of like, hey, I should be on the I should be in the room because I'm quality. But actually, um, there's some things that I think I'd like to highlight to you, uh, and and sort of taking it like that. I, I, absolutely, because I think at the very at the very base, we're uh, we're all in jobs because we add value, and the key is to demonstrate that we are adding value. And if that value of quality is not seen then people start 
avoid inequality, avoid quality because they're only the police. Yeah. Uh, and it's not good for the organization because you get commercial surprises, bad news. Uh, and in the worst case, quality gets totally ignored and then you get regulatory enforcement as the outcome. That's too far down the road. Things have already gone badly wrong by that point. So if, if you're, a, if you're a, a young quality leader in a plant and the plant director goes to the, the leadership team meetings, just try and find some interesting and useful, valuable things to, to share with that plant director and build that relationship. Even if you don't have a, 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 a demand to do that, provide that information because any leader worth their salt is going to want to take all of the facts and all of the information that they can to ensure their own success and the success of their team. So make your boss look good. Basically. Exactly so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so coming, coming to that, uh, it, what was really interesting was when you sort of uh, said, you know, don't talk about the 21, don't quote the 21 CFR, you know, um, you don't need to go into that level of detail when you're sitting around a table uh, with people that are not quality. Um, so, so it would be really good if you could give me some really clear do's and don'ts. Don't talk about this. And then also, here are some of the words, here are some of the themes that business people do want to hear about. So, so I think the first thing I'd say is it's important for us to think about doing our own work, if I put it as bluntly as that. Sometimes, uh, you know, the quality person comes in and yes, they quote, hey, there's a new regulation coming. This is the detail. This is the reference. This is the date when it cuts in. And then sort of they don't do the so what. You know, mm -hmm. we, we've got to do our own our own cooking. And that's the bit that's sometimes forgotten. We need to say, OK, there's all of these new things coming in. Which ones can we just take care of? You know, we need a new sentence on some simple labeling and packaging. Just deal with the right people, get it done. Doesn't need to be a leadership team, leadership team discussion. In two years time, there's going to be a total transformation of the regulations may impact everything. Let's actually figure out what it's going to do. Certainly have a date certainly have a potential impact and then do that analysis. Think about it in business terms. Is it going to slow the speed to market? Is it going to benefit us more or less versus our competitors? Is it actually going to mean some of these products are going to be not cost effective? On the other side of it, and this is the thinking ahead, are there some products that you're aware of in the company that may benefit you might be able to access them into that country now you've never been able to do it before and i think one of the things that has that shocks me sometimes when i talk to companies years ago i used to go and do do audits and things like that i'd talk to the quality people quality managers and the plant and say okay so what what products do you make here well i look after these ones yeah but what's the total portfolio of products that come out of this plant don't know you know so so think about the complete portfolio think about the impact not just on what's directly in front of you but on the whole broader piece because that's that open-minded thinking that a leadership team is is hoping to hear or that, that a boss is hoping to hear that's where you can actually bring that creativity into play and say this there's an opportunity here this change presents an opportunity everyone talks about business growth growth in all types Think about where we can see a change and then be able to, to leverage that change for, for the good of the company, because that's, you know, we're, when we're working for companies, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make that company better and more successful. So, so, so just, to, just to recap some of those key themes that um, non-quality people want to be hearing about, that's going to get you credibility when you're sitting in that room. We spoke about fast speed to market, we spoke Absolutely. about competitive advantage against um, other competitors yeah. portfolios. We spoke about uh, new access into new markets. So is there a way to yeah. get uh, new access for new products into new markets? What else did you say? I think those were the key ones. Those it's the all ones. around the value and return on investment, obviously, but uh, think about it in business terms. We're in, you know, if we draw an analogy, another, what I'll call a boring function, is something like accounting and so on. They don't bring the information about, you know, if you look at US GAAP versus your blah, blah, blah. Nobody's 
being having those information brought they're getting the the numbers the synthesis this is what's happening this is what it means if this trend continues this will happen we need to think about that in the same way look about what's happening look about what the trends are look about what the opportunities are don't show all of our uh, all of our cooking uh, in a leadership team, in a senior team organization, in a non-quality leadership organization, because nobody, nobody needs to know. On the other side of it, as I said, in a broader quality leadership team, we've got to have those detailed discussions so that we can decide what is our professional recommendation of a direction for the company. But those are two very different sorts of meetings. And I think that's something that it's sometimes hard for us to get our heads around. If we're having a quality leadership team discussion, we're talking about the nerdy details. And that's right, because we're bringing all of our brains together as a team and saying this is what's going to be best for the organization. But if we're in a multidisciplinary team, they don't want to see all of the, the working. or They want to see this is our recommendation as a team of professionals. Let's go this way as this company. Yeah, yeah. So, so don't worry about the how, but this is the what. My team will yeah. take care of it. Um, and this is how I can help you make or save money ultimately. As well. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. What are some of the other mistakes that you, uh, along your career that you've seen uh, quality professionals making in terms of <laughs> communication? I think the, cl the classic one, and uh, I'll just refer it, but uh, don't be seen as the police. Because as soon as quality is seen as the, the police, you know, I've somehow I've got to get round the quality department to launch this product, release this lot. That that's a problem. So don't be quoting all of these things. Uh, and I think the other one is the one that I talked uh, briefly about with the the leadership team interactions. Is think about the 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 timeline. Think about the pulse on which the company works. The company has a you know one, three, five year planning cycle. It's no good waiting until that planning cycle has finished, being halfway through the year, and then coming in as the quality guy and say, hey, this, uh, this is now urgent. Well, why didn't you tell me it was coming a year, two years a, a ahead so that we can start planning that in? You know, we usually have a long, uh, a long lead times in, in regulatory change, maybe China excluded, but uh, there's usually a long lead time in regulatory change. If we're engaged with the industry, we can see something that's coming. We have an early warning. We need to be able to package up that early warning within the company so that quality is working on the same sort of planning cycles as the rest of the organization. Because that, that's the one thing that really blows your credibility if you're, you know, Budgets are locked, plans are there, promises are made up the line. And then you come in and say, hey, I need another couple of million dollars here because of this thing that I could have known about 18 months ago. That, that becomes a problem very quickly. But it's something that we often focus on the drop dead deadlines. We don't focus on those small steps ahead of that that allows an organization to plan for it. Yeah, so, so there's got to be a balance though right between being able be, talking about what's coming and not being the boy that cries wolf that like exactly dramatic and everything is coming all the time so how do you it's, navigate that so so i think the important thing is it's back to sort of doing our work within our own function knowing which are the big things that are coming mm. you know and and we're the people who are in every organization we're the people who are charged with doing that analysis. If there's a small requirement for a labeling change in a relatively small country, nobody needs to know. If there's a big change, the whole organization needs to be discussing it. That's back to the, to the business focus of quality and the ROI focus in quality. We actually need to understand the business implications of the changes that are coming. Uh, they may appear to be relatively relatively minimal within our own you know maintenance of the qms within the maintenance of the certificates we may say oh, that's, that's a small thing but then if you think about 10 factories in your company make having to change every component that they make every labeling you know taking some of the materials out this when when uh, rose rojas came in that was a huge thing for manufacturing but for quality it was not really 
a big deal. Yeah, we're compliant. Just put it on a bit of paperwork. We're done. But that was a big deal for the organizations. Getting that ahead to be able to say, this is coming. We're going to have to do this. Let's start working through it. That makes it much less painful for the organization and gives us some credibility. Thanks so much for that, Paul. So, Paul, you mentioned uh, earlier you know, what we really need to avoid doing is being seen as the police, right? But I'm wondering if you're a quality person within an organization, how can you go about proactively finding out how you're perceived? So, uh, firstly, I 100% agree we've, we've got to avoid being uh, being seen as the police uh, but some there's some uh, some areas you can just literally see watch how the dialogue with you goes in those in those team meetings and be sensitive to that and uh, you know I won't sort of dive too deeply into it but uh, quite often we find that the people in our in our roles tend to be a little bit more introverted by nature not necessarily uh, going out and and asking for feedback so you know the first step is you know go with the flow a little bit just listen to what's going on around you listen to the types of things you're being asked listen to the sorts of dialogues you're being invited to but that's a more of a passive solution and I think that's the easy part for us to do the other part to do is to actually say no we've we've got to actively go out there and ask for feedback and uh, we we can do it one to one we, we should do it one-to-one. -one. And I don't mean within the structure of whatever the company has as formal review process and so on. I, I mean, adjacent to that more frequently than that, actually saying, you know, are you getting what you need from quality? That's a bit more neutral question than uh, am I performing in the level you want? Uh, but you know, that's basically what you're trying to build up to. The other thing that I'd, I'd recommend uh, and I'm a fan of is some of these 360 degree review type tools. Uh, you can then use those uh, not just to get feedback from your internal customers, but to also get a little bit of feedback from your team mm -hmm. uh, on how things are going. Because I think uh, you raise a really great point there that uh, one of the th potential threats you can see with a leader particularly a first line supervisor, you know, manager of quality, who is starting to try and get themselves engaged within the leadership team, starting to speak with manufacturing in terms that manufacturing lead. Maybe some of the people who work for them are getting this feeling that my boss isn't a real quality guy, He's, he or she is going to the dark side. Um, so being able to understand what your team are feeling about how you are interacting with the organization is also important because part of what our job is we're quality leaders but we are leaders so we need to take them on that same journey as well and if they are a you know 10-year quality professional working at the bench level if they've only ever seen the police model in their previous leaders they're going to be a little bit nervous about that change of model so you'll need to take them along that journey so that those sorts of feedback tools, particularly there's plenty of them out there, you can download them for free if your company doesn't have one. Those sorts of feedback tools are really valuable, not just to see what your company internal customers are saying, but also what your own team are saying and feeling, because that uh, it's all about managing, managing the change. If you're trying to work differently as quality, it has to be the whole team working together. Because the one thing that, uh, is going to destroy that relationship is if the team leader is becoming engaged and aligned with the broader company and talking in business terms but the the team who actually work with them are sort of no i'm box checking i'm specification leading i'm the police for this that's going to cause a problem and you know you'll get that feedback but it's best to try and predict it and prevent it bit of the same theme think a little bit further down the line, what do I need to start doing today so things will be great in two years? Mm. Really good, really good, uh, really good perspective. And nice question, right? Are you getting what you need mm. from quality? Because it is really neutral, it's nice and open, and it's not um, not pushing the, the other person one way or another. So it's uh, that's a great question to, to, to be asking. 
something something on to, to your point about okay let's say that you're um, a quality leader you're going on this journey of uh, connecting with other leaders within the business seeing seeing the global picture speaking in their language but then as you say you might have someone in your team who's really digging their heels in and is not aligned with your vision what do you do so i always start from the premise that uh, you know the person is not let's call it inherently a bad person so let's give that great benefit of the doubt there to start so you you know they are a a product of their history and their training clearly and if they've been brought up all the time that it's about you know measuring the components doing the specification has everything been met on the batch record check tick sign everything goes out that mechanistic view if that's what they've been trained to then it's a different difficult to change that mindset because you can't say i don't care about specifications obviously they're there for a reason but one of the things that i've found in the past that that opens people's eyes a little bit particularly in the pharma and, and med tech space is to think so so what actually is the are these products being used for where are they being where where do they actually touch real people touch patients and start thinking about that from that patient perspective when people start getting a closer understanding of how this is being really used you know on people they may know on family members on themselves then you start thinking about well wait a minute i could delay this release i could do this i could do that but then you'll think actually someone's waiting to get treated with this product. No, yeah. I need to be a bit more customer focused. Maybe it's as simple as yes, I will work over lunchtime. <laughs> Maybe it's more complex than that. But thinking about solving the problem of end to end supply to meet the patient's needs. And you know, there's a broad discussion about in, in the industry, not just this industry about customer experience. Yeah. And I think that's important. And that's a good lens to look at it through. But within the pharma and med tech space i think it's important to think customer experience but don't think pay or experience think it's the patient at the end that's being treated with that device with that product and then put that lens on what you're doing and it's not just okay that passes that fails if it fails kick it back to manufacturing manufacturing's problem no you've detected a fault that's going to negatively impact a customer a patient how do i work with manufacturing to get that solved so that we can hit the delivery deadlines where someone is waiting for a fully compliant high quality product but we can't have it not turn up mm -hmm. so starting to open their eyes a bit think end to end think about the patients often again you find first level uh, qc uh, qc workers in an organization they might have a vague idea of what's being used, but they haven't actually seen what's really being done with patients. So getting our understanding, maybe do hosp you know, hospitals are often open to hospital visits, may not during COVID, but in normal times, hospitals are open to hospital visits, make it part of their continuing education, make it part of their training so that you actually see products in use, get feedback, get feedback from users as in nurses and doctors, get feedback from patients who've been successfully treated those sorts of things can help fo refocus that team that it's not about being the, the specification police it's about delivering quality end to end from raw material to patient treatment the whole piece and that we are actually accountable for all of that we don't just spot spot a problem and bat it back across the wall and say sorry that's you manufacturing no we have to work together to solve those problems having that sort of dialogue that sort of discussion helps build that nothing to you know it's all about making the patient experience better nothing to do with cutting corners nothing to do with not caring about specifications but it's the specifications are something that helps you get to a satisfied safe treatment of a patient it's not the be all and end all. So you've 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 shared some really wise words, really helpful practical tips that our listeners, I'm sure, are going to be able to sort of go and implement straight away. One question I have for you is what's the best piece of advice you've ever had? 
<laughs> so the best piece of advice I've ever had as a bit of career advice is actually advice that I was given uh, by, a, uh, by a leader who was not a quality leader. Uh, it was a general manager leader in the organization. And at that time I was considering, um, you know, I was actually gonna leave that organization. I did leave that organization. And I had two different uh, jobs. One had a nice director title and a salary accordingly. Uh, and one had a manager title and okay, it was better company, but it was, could some could have seen that as a lateral move. And I talked to this guy, I said, wow, you know, I'm gonna get a director at this age. Uh, this, is, this is awesome. Uh, look at the salary I'm gonna get. And my, this guy who was my mentor was actually saying, you know, where do you, what do you really want to achieve? What are you gonna learn from that role? What are you going to actually take away? They're going to give you more money in that director job, but they're just squeezing your existing knowledge out of you. You're not going to learn anything new going there. If you go to this different company, which is in a slightly different space, you're going to learn some different skills. You're going to learn things that are going to help you grow for the future. So I sort of, I hadn't thought about it that way. I was, you know, chasing the, chasing the dollars, as they say. And uh, I actually took his advice. And I did go for the, the thing that looked as if it was a lateral move. And that was actually great. It uh, gave me some of my experiences of also being accountable for, uh, for things that were beyond quality. Mm. Um, you know, so I got a little bit, I'd learned a lot more experience. And, you know, at the end of the day, he was doubly right because the company I didn't go to had gone bankrupt two years later. So, <laughs> you know. Okay, so, so good, good decision then. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Really, really nice. So, so always look for the, the growth opportunities then. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So absolutely. Well, especially around this time of year where people are considering, you know, their, their careers is that's really, that's really good advice on how to choose between absolutely. two different offers. So a bonus. <laughs> I, 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 absolutely. And that's something I've, whenever I've talked to people that I provide mentoring to, I've said, even for internal things, you know, why are you considering that? Are you running towards it for the right reason? Or are you running away from something else? Think through what's, what, what it's going to be like in two years, three years. Why are you going there? So I've got one final question for you, mm. Paul, which is the one that I love to ask all of the guests on the show. <laughs> it's the big one. So you, you talk a lot about big picture. So hopefully you'll, you'll like this one. What's the legacy that you want to leave on the world? So, so I think the, the, the big thing that I'd like to leave, and you only take a small slice of it at a time, is actually for quality to be a destination function. So people actually say, you know, I want to go and work in quality. I can grow my career there. I can do something good for patients in medtech. Uh, you know, I can be someone who's actually improved a lot of people who need the products. So... Uh, that, that's what I would like to have as, uh, you know, uh, the thing that I deliver to the world, <laughs> aiming big. <laughs> Why not? And I think, you know, with, with, uh, with the, the people that have been listening today, I'm sure that you've been able to, to touch their lives and their careers, even indirectly through all your words of wisdom and experience. So, Paul, it's been fabulous to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity. I think it's always good to be able to... Uh, share what I can to help other people in their careers. And to all our listeners, don't forget to give this a like, comment, follow Paul, uh, connect with him uh, and let us know your feedback on this episode. And I'll see you soon for another episode of Career Diaries by Elamed. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>